Good evening, everyone. I'm going to try that again. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Street, and I serve as the executive director of the Clinton Foundation. And on behalf of all the staff and the volunteers here at the, the Clinton Presidential Center, let me welcome you all to a very, very special evening. I have the distinct honor of introducing our featured speaker, Dr. Irene Butter, in just a few moments. Dr. Butter is an author, professor emeritus, an inspiring public speaker, and a Holocaust survivor. Dr. Butter is one of the most resilient people I've ever had the privilege of meeting. And she has truly transformed the painful experiences of her early years into a life of important social activism. Before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to first recognize some of the other remarkable guests that we actually have in the audience this evening. Aniko Diamond, and Fred Hilsenrath, accompanied by his wife, Eleanor. Will you stand and let us recognize you? <laughs> now these special guests, like Dr. Butter, are both Holocaust survivors and actually live right here in Arkansas. We are very honored by your presence and truly appreciate your efforts to join us this evening. Thank you so much. I'd also like to recognize some individuals who were very instrumental in developing and supporting the Anne Frank Tree installation and our educational programming associated with it. Marianne Tettelbaum, the director of the Jewish Federation of Arkansas, who is here with her husband, Dorian Stuber. Thank you. <laughs> Steve and Jennifer Ronnell. I'm not sure where they are seated. There they are. The Ronnell family. Yay. The Ronnells actually. Uh, happen to be my next door neighbors, but Steve and Jennifer uh, graciously agreed to chair our Anne Frank Paver campaign that supports important programs like this one. So we're very grateful to you all, and I'm so happy to see uh, your mom and dad here tonight, too. The Anne Frank Center USA, which is located in New York, the Sisterhood of Congregation B'nai Israel. They were so instrumental in helping us submit the application for the Anne Frank tree um, and helped us uh, develop the incredible uh, exhibit around it as well. So thank you so much to the Sisterhood. The Ben J. Alzheimer Foundation, who is represented by our own Mike Seelig this evening. Mike serves as the Food, Beverage, and Special Events Director here at the Clinton Center, and we're so grateful for the ongoing support of the Alzheimer Foundation. Thank you so much, Mike, and he's here with his lovely wife, Jennifer. And also uh, the TRG Foundation, again, a really important partner for us in the development of our exhibit and the accompanying program. And I hope you were able to stop by and see the Anne Frank Tree installation. It's located right outside here on our grounds as you come in from the parking lot. And if you haven't, I hope you'll take notice of it. It may be a little dark when you leave, but please come back and spend some time uh, not just looking on the tree, but in reflecting on the powerful and important messages of this uh, installation. The exhibit is actually anchored by a sapling that was taken from the only tree that Anne Frank could see from her window in the secret hiding place where she and her family hid from the Nazis. The tree and the accompanying exhibit remind us of our past and inspire us to work for human rights and social justice for all human beings. The messages from this exhibit couldn't be more powerful than they are now in our very polarized country. Well, I now have the great privilege of introducing Dr. Butter to the podium. Although with the formative years of her life were inundated by immense loss, Dr. Butter has taken great strides to, to transform the trauma into a powerful message of hope, humanity, peace, and progress. And as a matter of fact, she has recently published a memoir and the title embodies her very nature. It's called Shores Beyond Shores, From Holocaust to Hope. I am absolutely thrilled that she's come all the way to Little Rock to, sell, to share her remarkable story with all of us tonight. Please help me welcome Dr. Irene Butter to the stage.
Thank you so much, Mrs. Street, for this very welcoming and generous introduction. And thank you all for being here this evening. I am, thanks, I'm going to talk about the Holocaust, which covered the first part of my life, my early childhood, uh, till age 15, when I arrived on the shores of America. And um, some people think it's now ancient history. 75 years ago makes it history. But I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, not only uh, does it continue to preoccupy us, but I think the, the Holocaust is more relevant today than it has been for several decades. Just what's going on in the world today and in our own country remind us how vigilant we must be to try to prevent the repercussions of authoritarianism and dictatorship. We cannot let it happen again. <laughs> So also, because this is an, an event to celebrate the legacy of Anna Frank, I'm going to draw some parallels between the life of the Frank family and my own past um, uh, to make that connection. Um, I wanted to say that there are some parallels today to what happened during the Holocaust. We have ethnic cleansing. We have persecution, we have deportation, we have breaking up of families, we have deprivation of basic human rights, children who don't have food and medical care. So we must keep that in mind. That shouldn't have happened then, and it certainly shouldn't happen again now. Now, um, right now, the groups that are targeted in this country are African Americans, people from Africa, and people from Latin American countries. And usually, targeted people, targeted groups, are labeled. So the labels that are applied now are rape and terrorists. All these people that we don't want, are, we don't want them because they are rapists and they are terrorists. And of course, we know you can't generalize anything like that, and it's not true. Now, during the Holocaust, the group that was targeted were the Jews. Jews weren't the only group, but they were the primary group. Hitler wanted to make the world free of Jews. Not just Germany, but all of Europe uh, was covered by his mission. And so the labeling that was applied to us was we were called criminals, we were thieves, we were cockroaches, we were pigs, we were vermin. That's, those are the terms used by the Nazis to describe Jews. And unfortunately, there were too many people who accepted these labels. Now, um, I hope that this talk will inspire many of you to become more cognizant of what is happening and become more involved in fighting it and resisting it and in using your rights and your power to protest because the consequences are unimaginable if, if this keeps escalating. And I just want to say that everyone can act, whether it's a big step or a small step. Everything you do matters, no matter how small. And if you don't act, if you decide to be passive and silent and a bystander, that also matters. So please take these words to heart. Now, um, using, taking off from the labels that were applied to Jews during the Holocaust, I want to show you a few pictures of my family. And then you can decide whether the labels apply. But first of all, this is a map. And it shows my, my journey. And these are all the, all the trips 
all the all the traveling that I was forced to make. It wasn't by choice. It, it, it was by force. And I was born in Berlin. And then when the Nazis came to power, my family moved to Holland, to Amsterdam. Uh, we thought we would be safe there, but that was not the case. Uh, we were deported to Camp Westerbork, which was a German transit camp in Holland, in the Netherlands. From there, we were forced to Bergen-Belsen, a concentration camp in Germany. And um, then um, I'll tell you the rest of the story later. So um, my family. This is the wedding picture of my, my parents. And they were married in 1928. And this is my brother and myself. My brother Werner was his name. And he was two years older than I was, so we're pretty little at that stage. This is a photo of my father and myself. I was about five years old. My father was my hero, my idol. And I loved him more than anybody else in the world. These are my grandparents. And I was, my brother and I were so fortunate to live with my grandparents in the same house. We grew up with them. It's my grandmother holding me as a baby and my grandfather holding my brother when he was a baby. And they spoiled us. They were playful. They were loving. They took us on trips. They treated us in many different ways. And it, I just have wonderful memories of my grandparents. Now, um, I have to go back. So things started happening in Germany. Hitler came to power in 1933, and the persecution of the Jews began. Uh, people were fired from, Jews were fired from their jobs. Jewish children were beaten up in schools. Um, the syn synagogues were burned and the, the deportation to concentration camps began in the early 30s. My grandfather owned a bank, and my father was his partner. Then one day, the Nazis decided that Jews couldn't own banks anymore, and uh, the bank was taken away from him, so my father became unemployed. And he decided we should leave the country. He went to Holland an adjoining country, and thought that our family would be free there, would escape Hitler. Unfortunately, that did not happen. And um, my father left to go to Amsterdam. And luckily, he was able to get a job with the American Express Company in Amsterdam. So then my mother prepared everything. We had to get many permits to take our belongings, many things we were not allowed to take. Money was very limited, the amount of money you could take with you. But um, we felt free when we first arrived, and I was so thrilled to be reunited with my dad because he was away for several months before we could follow him. But the sad part was that we couldn't bring our grandparents to Holland. They were not allowed uh, to leave the country. And um, um, that, that was just a terrible turn in our lives. We arrived in Amsterdam, went to school right away, learned the Dutch language. Didn't take very long at uh, my age. I was seven, my brother was nine. And we loved the country. We loved the Dutch people. They were so welcoming. There wasn't any bullying or discrimination because we were German, we were immigrants. Um, we had a very good life. We got bicycles because in Holland, everyone bicycles everywhere. And I remember the wonderful trips we took as a family to the countryside in Holland. Um, we, uh, well, it was just a good life until the Nazis invaded Holland, and exactly what we wanted to escape, Hitler followed us to the Netherlands. There was a battle for several days, and then the Dutch surrendered, 
and instantly, Holland became a Nazi-occupied country. Um, the Nazis took over, they ruled the country, and the persecution of Jews escalated. So here we were in Holland, and uh, we experienced all kinds of restrictions. It all happened gradually, but it never got any better. So first of all, Jews were prohibited from many public places. The museums, the libraries, the movie houses, parks, um, playgrounds, swimming pools, all those places that my brother and I enjoyed and that kids enjoy. And uh, so that was the beginning, but it only started. Then there was a rule that people who were not Jewish could not come to our house, and we couldn't go to the house of anybody who wasn't Jewish. So my best friend was not Jewish, and for us to get together, we had to be out on the street. Then we, there was an edict. We had to wear the Jewish star on the left side of our clothing whenever we were out of the house so people could see immediately who was a Jew and who wasn't. And then the public schools were prohibited to Jews, and they started Jewing, Jewish schools with only Jewish kids and Jewish teachers. And um, in the beginning, that was OK, except the school was further from my house, and our bicycles were confiscated. All Jews had to turn in their bicycles. We were not allowed to use any public transportation, and without bicycles, we could only go as far as our, our distance would allow us to walk. Next came the deportation, and to be in a Jewish school was a sad experience because time after time, more seats in the class were no longer occupied. People had the choice. Either they would make the decision, like the Frank family, and go into hiding, or they would just hold on and, until the deportation occurred. And now I had a friend, who was kind of my first boyfriend, his name was Rudy, and one day he did not appear in class anymore, and I knew that he was going to be deported, that he was deported. He sent me a card once from Vesterborg, and I was so thrilled, because you were only allowed two cards a month, I think, to send out of the camp, and that he had sent me a, a card, and I treasured it. So one day, my father met a friend on the street who had just received Ecuadorian passports from Sweden, from a man in Sweden, and he gave my father the address. And immediately, my father sent a letter to Sweden with four passport photos. Uh, but the, the, password, the passports didn't come, and of course, my father tried everything else. He tried to get on a list for Palestine. He tried to get a visa for America. But um, most, not pal even Palestine, it was difficult for Jews to go because it was still under the British mandate. And immigration to the United States was also highly restricted. So where was one to go? We were hoping these passports would be an avenue of survival. But then the day came when our neighborhood was rounded up, and I guess I, I should, um, I want to show you the house we lived in in Amsterdam. We lived on the second floor of this building, and it also shows Anna Frank's home in the same neighborhood. Um, it's a house which was very similar. Now, um, I didn't know her very well. She was my brother's age, so she, she was older than I was. We did not go to the same schools, but we did have mutual friends. And uh, if I saw her on the street, I would, knew, I would know who she was. So this is one comparison. And then we both had school pictures taken, and this was the way the Dutch approached taking pictures of, of kids. You can see the same setting. 
um, sitting there with a notebook and a pen in the hand. Um, and um, it shows in another parallel in, in our journeys. Now, um, I mentioned that the time came when our neighborhood was rounded up. Uh, the Nazis came with loudspeakers and they told everyone to get off the streets. Nobody was allowed in the neighborhood. It was a neighborhood where many Jews lived. It wasn't a ghetto, but it was a very nice neighborhood where immigrants and other Jews had settled. And so the Nazis came. It was a Sunday morning. It was June. It was a very hot day. And uh, I remember my mother saying to us, wear several layers of clothing because you're only allowed to take what you can carry and you'll have more clothing with you. So they came and they went from door to door and from house, from house to house, from door to door. And I remember hearing them marching up the two flights of stairs and then knocking on the door of our apartment. And they came in. And they said, you have 10 minutes to pack, and then you'll have to leave. So what do you pack in 10 minutes? Well, we, we were kind of prepared for this. And so um, we had pre-packed for, for that trip, even though it wasn't our own plan. Um, hundreds of Jews that day in June were marched to a big square with all their belongings that they could carry babies, old people. And then they came with big trucks and loaded us on those trucks. And the trucks took us to a railroad station. And here you see the train that was waiting for us at the railroad station. It, it wasn't a passenger car. It was a cattle car. And each of those wagons, they pushed 60, 70, and sometimes more people into the wagon. There was no food, there was no water, there was no toilet, and sometimes there wasn't even enough room to sit down and people were standing. So that day we spent about eight hours in the cattle car and arrived at Camp Vesterborg, which was a, a transit camp um, in the Netherlands where most people did not stay very long. The, the camp was very crowded. The barracks we lived in had bunk beds. They were steel framed, three tiers, and there was very little space for each person, only a little one third of the space under the bed. Um, there was no privacy. There were people all the time. The adults had jobs, not terribly arduous jobs, but uh, most of the jobs had to do with maintenance of the camp. And um, children like me, and I was 12 years old, uh, didn't work. There were no jobs for children. Now, we didn't have school. We didn't have toys. We didn't have books. Uh, there certainly weren't any radios or television or cell phones or anything that you might think of these days to spend your time on. Life was really boring. The food was bad, but um, in the beginning it was ample. Uh, we didn't starve, and we were allowed to receive cap packages from friends if we had friends left in Holland and there was any food available still that they could send. So um, Vesterborg um, was not a very welcoming place. But um, the most serious trauma of this camp was that every Saturday, a cattle car like this train came into the camp. The camp was situated on two sides of a railroad track. So wherever you went uh, outside of your barrack, you would see this ominous train. And you would be in fear because the train would sit there all of Saturday, all of Sunday, all of Monday. And then Monday night at 11 o'clock, every week, 
the barrack leaders would turn on the light and they would read off the, the names of people who had to go on that train that day. And all the trains went to Eastern Europe to death camps. Majority of them went to Auschwitz, but some of them went to different camps. And um, altogether, 102,000 people were deported from Westerbork uh, to a death camp. And so every Monday, you sat in fear, waiting for that time when the list was read, and it was usually alphabetical. And my name was Hasenberg, so we sat there, waiting for H to come. And then if our name wasn't read, we would be pleased, but then we would get dressed and go to the barracks where friends or relatives of ours stayed that we knew and see if they were on the list, and very often they were. Most of the time there was somebody who uh, was close to you, either a friend or a relative. And then we would go and spend a few hours with them, and the train usually left at four in the morning. We spent those hours and walked them to the train. And then there was the moment of saying goodbye, knowing with some certainty that you would probably never see each other again. So trains continue to have this symbolic meaning to me. They were a symbol of separation. They were a symbol of loss. They were a symbol of death. And for many, many years, I remember walking my dog along the river, and there was a railroad track, and whenever the train came by, I would choke up even if I wasn't thinking about the train. It was just such a dominant theme uh, of, of the whole Holocaust, really. The train was, was evil. So one of the better things that happened was that after we were in Westerbork for about six months, the passports arrived. The passports came from Sweden. They were Ecuadorian passports. And it was thought that this would be a way of survival, that if we had those passport, passports, it made a difference. Because we were no longer just Jews. We were now called exchange Jews. The Germans, the German government had a policy, an exchange policy, which meant that at some point they wanted to get German citizens and German prisoners back from allied countries. And they would use Jews with passports to exchange for German citizens. And um, while this did never happen on a large scale, and there were many consuls in many European countries, even in the Ukraine, and in Poland, and in France, and in Belgium. There were um, consuls who manufactured these passports, even if their government was not really behind it, uh, in order to save Jews. So these passports came, and that was this maybe the single moment of joy that we had uh, during the eight months that we spent in Westerbork. It took two more months until we received the news that we were going to be exchanged. We would be sent to another camp in Germany. They told us it was going to be a better camp, better than Westerbork, where we were at that point in time, and that we wouldn't be there very long because we would be exchanged. So this kind of built up our hope. And when the train came, it was a passenger train. It, it wasn't a train like you see uh, in this slide. It wasn't a cattle car train. And it really fooled us because we thought, gee, they're treating us like human beings. So maybe things will get better. But when we arrived in um, Bergen-Belsen, it, it was a different story. And I'm going to read a passage about the arrival there.
<laughs> Trying to find my piece. Okay. The barking got louder, louder and louder, and I covered my ears. Our compartment door was thrust open, and a young German soldier stood there, shaking, saying nothing. I searched his face for, for what he wanted. He had a thick, thick blonde hair under a green cap pulled back so far that it covered the color of his sweeping overcoat. His boots reflected the lights, so shiny and so new as if the cobbler had just delivered them. His lips were red, red enough to be rouged. I thought that he started to smile, so I relaxed a little. And then there was a whistle, and he began to yell. Get out, rouse, get out now, he yelled through his red lips. He swore using words that I was not familiar with, even if I didn't understand them. The German he spoke sounded so bad, high and brittle like an icicle, not like the lower, warm German that my parents used. Okay, where am I? So we stepped out of, the, out of the car, and there were German soldiers everywhere, large and large tan and black shepherd dogs, which were, with long snouts, snarled at us, and they would have, they would have bit us if they, the leashes had not restrained them from doing so. I tripped on something <clears throat> leaving the, the train car and um, f fell on my knees on the frozen, pockmarked ground. An immense, bristling dog jumped at me and would have bitten me. Rainy, look at me. Rainy was my name that everybody used at that time, said my mom. She said, look at me. Dogs that bark don't, don't bite. And so I, my introduction to Bergen-Belsen was not good. It wasn't what ha had been promised, that this would be a better camp. But I did not realize how bad it would become. So here we are in Bergen-Belsen. You can get an idea of the barracks. Don't have many pictures of Bergen-Belsen. And um, the barracks were built very poorly. In the winter, the, the um, wind blew in and it was cold. The rain dripped in and flooded the barrack. And in the summer, sometimes it became hot. The situation in Bergen-Belsen was horrible. The food was minimal. We got very small rations, like a piece of bread this wide once a day and a soup at night, which was turnips boiled in water. If you were lucky, you would find a piece of potato at the bottom of your bowl. Uh, adults were subjected to slave labor. The work week was six and a half days, and sometimes there was punishment, and they worked seven days. It was from early in the morning to late at night. Another form of torture was roll call, called appel, where we had to stand on a big square every day to be counted. And they could never get it right. So at times, we stood on this square for five, six, or even seven hours. And occasionally, there would be roll call even twice a day. It, 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 it was horrible. You had to stand in place. You couldn't move. You couldn't talk. And um, was, some people collapsed, and some people died right on the roll call square. Now, uh, another source of death was 
that the hygienic conditions were atrocious. We lived in very crowded quarters. The, the hygiene was terrible. Uh, we only had cold water. We didn't have soap. And or whatever we got didn't resemble what you think of as soap. And um, there was torture. People were brutally beaten. And because of the malnutrition, the combination of malnutrition and poor hygiene, there were epidemics. There were horrible diseases. An epidemic of typhus, which was the most deadly one. There was also cholera. There was infant uh, well, there was polio, we don't call it that anymore. Um, there was tuberculosis, dysentery, pneumonia, all kinds of horrible diseases. And um, one really tough lesson was uh, to learn to cope with death. Because in the end, after we'd been there almost one year, every morning I would wake up, I would look around me and find who had died during the night. So um, life was pretty gruesome. And where was the exchange? We were sent to Bergen-Belsen to be exchanged. It, it was an exchange camp. And um, it just, there, sometimes there were rumors, but they never turned out to be true. Um, almost one year after we arrived there, there was an announcement that there would be an exchange transport that everyone who had American passports, South American or North American, had to report to a screening station where a doctor would decide whether you're able to go on this transport, go on this train. And uh, my mother, who had been sick for several months and wasn't even able to get out of bed anymore, um, I had been taking care of her. So my brother and I dressed her, and we tried to help her walk to the screening station, which wasn't very far, but um, she was too weak, and she collapsed on the way. So we took her back to the barrack, and my brother and I went, and the um, doctor approved us. He checked off our names on a long list, and um, that was that. So later on the day, my father returned from work, but he, he, didn't, he seemed very unwell. We didn't really know what had happened to him. Not that he was well before, but something certainly had deteriorated his condition. So I asked him to follow me to the screening station, and he said, no, I can't. I have to lie down. I'm weak. I'm sick. And I pleaded with him to come because that seemed to be the only chance we would ever have to be exchanged. And then he agreed, leaning on me, we walked to the screening doctor, and he said to my father, you're John Hasenberg, are you sick? Which seemed to be a ridiculous question, given what he looked like. Uh, but my father said no. And he looked at me. And um, he crossed off my mother's name, and he said, your children have already been here, so prepare for transport tomorrow. You'll be leaving on a train. He didn't say where, but he said we would be leaving. And um, that certainly was a miracle as far as we were concerned, because uh, we never knew, we never will know whether this Nazi doctor was, was being human and uh, allowed us to leave as a family, or whether he really didn't know that um, I was with my father, that it wasn't my mother, and um, whether he confused me for her, or it was something else, but we were approved. And luckily, there were some friends in Bergen-Belsen who helped to carry my mother to the train the next day, and also helped my, my dad to walk there. And um, finally, after many hours, or oh, this, this time it was a, a passenger train. It, w it wasn't a cattle car train. So that gave us some hope. And here's some drawings that students made, because I've spoken in many schools, and often I receive drawings from students. And so on the left side, you see the Red Cross train. And they call it the good train. And on the right side, there is this picture of a train and then my father's body on the bench.
because my father's my father died after two days on the train. He died in Germany, and his body was taken off the train in the small town called Biberach in Germany, uh, and his body put on a bench at the railroad station. Now, this, this was an unbelievable shock for us. My mother was so sick, she wasn't even aware of, of what had happened, and my brother and I had no choice but to remain on the train and continue the rest of the journey. So we arrived in Switzerland, and um, immediately upon arrival, um, well, I should say first, there were two, two more days on the train. We came to the border of Switzerland, at the border between Germany and Switzerland, and there the exchange actually took place. And they had German prisoners coming from America uh, on the railroad station of a little town. Uh, the train from America from the, that delivered them from the ship that they had boarded came to this town called Kreuzlingen. And on the other side of the track was a train with the people from Bergen-Belsen. And that's where the exchange took place. And then the next day, we were in Switzerland, and my mother and my brother were taken off the train immediately. They were hospitalized because my mother was dying. I mean, the doctors noticed it right away that she was so critical, critically ill, and my brother had another disease and couldn't walk. And uh, that left me with um, the group of people who came out of Bergen-Belsen. Some had died, but there were still a substantial number of um, uh, mostly Dutch and German Jews. And um, the, our passports, it turned out, were not valid. As a matter of fact, they were issued under the condition that when the war ends, we have to turn in the passports. And we could never apply for entering Ecuador in the future. I mean, there was no way that we would be accepted in Ecuador because we held these false passports. They just were not valid. They were not recognized. And the Swiss were not interested in keeping us in Switzerland. So the next journey then was to North Africa to a refugee camp in Algeria, uh, which this was before the end of the war. It was about three months, more than three months before the war ended. And uh, this camp had been set up some time before. It was an UNRWA camp, a United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Association. They administered this camp, and it was a precursor of the United Nations, which did not yet exist at that point. So here I was. I was 14 years old. My father had just died, and my mother and brother were in the hospital, and the Swiss wouldn't let me stay there. It took about three months before I had any news that they survived, that they were alive in the hospital in Switzerland. And eventually, after the war ended, we could correspond and write to each other, and I learned that they were getting healthier. We tried to get visas to the United States because we had family here, and uh, they went through all the paperwork of providing affidavits. You had to have an affidavit before you could get a visa uh, to the United States. And all this time, I was hoping that either I could go back to Switzerland or that they would come to Algiers to this camp so we could be together and then go to the United States, but that never happened. So after one year in this camp, uh, I um, was able to get a ship to America, stayed with relatives for several months until six months later, my mother and my brother came to the United States. Now, um, the family I stayed with, the relatives were wonderful, but, um, and they lived in New York City, took me into their apartment in the Bronx, and the first evening when I arrived there, they told me, now you're finally here in America, 
you, you will start a new life. You must forget everything and never talk about it again. And they were well-meaning. Uh, they, they felt that if I kept being drowned in my past, it would be very difficult to start a new life. And they were probably right in a way. But um, also, it was painful that nobody wanted to listen. Of course, it's very different today. I was very eager. Well, this is just a picture from, from the camp in Algiers. You can see the barracks and some friends. And the, these were some of the young people that um, spent time together in the camp. And hmm, lost something. So m I was very, very eager to go back to school. I hadn't been in school for three and a half years, no schooling. And um, started high school immediately, graduated from high school, attended college, uh, had summer jobs because my family was penniless. We had lost everything. We were homeless, we were penniless, and we were stateless. We did not have a nationality. Hitler took away the German citizenship from all Jews. Uh, the time we spent in Holland, we couldn't get citizenship. It was wartime. And um, the passports were invalid. So statelessness is, is also a situation that has become much more frequent. And uh, there are thousands and thousands of people now all over the world who have lost their citizenship because of the refugee situation and all the forces that lead to people having to leave their country and not being accepted in, in another country. So I, I had jobs while I was in college every summer as a waitress. And then after graduating from college, I went to graduate school. Uh, I met my husband at Duke University. We both got our PhDs there and started a family. These are my children. They're now in their 50s. <laughs> Time marches on. And here are my grandchildren. My daughter had two daughters, and, and they're grown up now. One is a lawyer, and one is in nursing school. And then my grandson, he's only 10. Um, I got my PhD in economics, so this is a picture of, of me uh, teaching economics. My husband and I both got positions at, on the faculty of the University of Michigan, where we were for many years and, and still live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, for over 50 years. And um, this is a, a picture of uh, my department. It's graduation day. All the faculty and all the students. <laughs> I was the, the only woman in the PhD program at Duke University. And, uh, but it just shows you that things have gotten better, because today, at least 50% of, of the faculty and the students would be female. I guarantee you, things have gotten better in that regard. Now, um, my children and my brother's children asked us at one point, I think it was in the 80s, uh, to take them on a journey to the sites of family history. So my brother and I went back to Bergen-Belsen with our kids. Um, this is a sign, and uh, it's a very dignified memorial ground. It's very beautiful with trees and shrubs and, and birds. I never saw a bird when I was in Bergen-Belsen. And here it says, um, visitors are, respect, are re requested to respect the dignity of these memorial grounds and to refrain from disturbing the peace of the dead. And here is a mass grave when the Allied forces came to Bergen-Belsen to liberate it. They just found masses of dead bodies scattered all over the grounds. And all they could do is bury people in mass graves. And so that's one of them. 
And this is a marker of Anna Frank. When I went back to Bergen-Belsen some years ago, um, I photographed this. This is not where she and her sister are buried, but it's a marker on the grounds. And you can see many people leave little things, flowers and toys and, and jewelry and all kinds of little things surrounding the grave. And uh, this is um, my brother and his children and um, myself with a grandchild and my daughter visiting my father's grave. He is buried in a Jewish cemetery in a small town in Germany. I've been there about six times. I've made friends with people in the town, especially the people who uh, take care of the cemetery. It's, it's a very remarkable town. It has a museum of Christian and Jewish history, uh, which has devoted an entire floor to the cultural contributions of former residents of the town called Laupai. They have two high schools named after two uh, former resi Jewish residents of, of the town. They invite high school students every year to come and help clean up the cemetery in the spring and in the fall and educate them about the history of the town. And I wish the whole country were like that, but that's not yet the case. And so sometime in the 80s, I realized, um, I became aware of the fact that here I survived and six million Jews did not, and so I, I wanted to pay back for my survival and became in, involved in peace work and in um, work for human rights and um, humanity in general. At the University of Michigan, I had the opportunity to co-found an endowment that honors Raoul Wallenberg every year. And um, he was a student there in the 1930s he was not a Jew, he was Swedish, but he was responsible for saving a number, I mean several thousands, some people say 100,000 Jews in Budapest, Hungary at the end of World War II. So um, since he is an, was an alum, um, we started an endowment which honors an outstanding humanitarian uh, every year, and this happens to be the year when the Dalai Lama received the Wallenberg Medal. And I had an opportunity to meet him, and it was amazing. And this is um, his family, step stepsister and um, other relatives of Wallenberg. And this is a picture with me, please. And she was the woman who had the major role of taking care of Anna Frank and her family when they were hiding in the attic um, for more than two years, I think. She was a wonderful person, and we gave her the medal. And um, she died a few years ago. I think she reached the age of 101. She took great risks uh, to help the Frank family because you weren't allowed to do that. You weren't allowed to help Jews, and uh, she could have been killed. But it was important to her. She said, when she came to Michigan, she said, I just did my human duty. And that was all. She didn't want any recognition or appreciation. And I like that term, my human duty. And so a another project I have been involved in for some time, I co-founded a group in Ann Arbor consisting of six Palestinian women and six Jewish women. And we have been meeting twice a month in our homes for more than 15 years now, uh, doing dialogue and um, refusing to be enemies. Uh, one of the women is a filmmaker, and um, she made a documentary about this group. And that's our motto, refusing to be enemies when the world tells us we should be enemies, but we refuse to do that. And um, this is a statue of Anna Frank that I think was uh, put there the last two years. It's in, uh, in a park, which is right in front of her house and somewhere in the back there 
on the right hand side was a house that Anna lived in. Um, and it's, it's another marker besides, of course, the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam that is visited by millions of people every year. And this was the tree in the attic, the only tree that Anna Frank could see while she was in hiding. And now there are all these saplings and there's a tree right in front of this building uh, and if, which grew from this sapling and will continue to grow as a reminder, as a, as a memory, and as a continuation of Anna Frank's legacy. And this is a tree that was grown from, an, from a sapling of that tree, and it's in, in Michigan, in um, the Holocaust Memorial Center in Farmington, outside of Detroit, Michigan. And um, this is our book that has been published recently. It's a memoir. Um, we hope that um, you had an opportunity to purchase it. But if not, we have some information here that you can order it. Uh, it's available on Amazon. And um, some people have asked me, why now, after all these years, why would you be writing this book? Well, I have been talking in schools, middle schools, high schools, uh, religious schools, college classes for more than 30 years. And um, it's been a enrichment in my life. And I found out that I could connect with students by telling them my story and that many students have an experience in their life. They don't have to be Jewish. And, it, and of course, it is in concentration camp, but they lose a parent or um, a, a close friend, or they have a mother who's schizophrenic, or they're descendants of the Armenian genocide, or they are from Nigeria and get bullied every day because of their black skin, and they have all kinds of experiences. And so the students have motivated me to work on this book. And um, my friends here, Chris, Holloway and John Bidwell, they have worked with me on this and they have made a huge difference in getting this book finished and making it um, a, a much more effective, impactful book, both in design and in, um, in text and in, in many ways. And they're here and you can talk to them. You, could, you also, if you have questions about the process, of how we worked on this book together. Uh, they will be happy to describe some of that. So I guess to end, I just hope that this horror will never be repeated, not only for Jews, but for all human beings. Um, we need to cross the divides. Uh, we, we need to refuse to be enemies, we need to stop being bystanders, and we need to recognize that we are all one human family, and that the differences that exist are smaller than what we have in common, all of us. So um, we'd be very happy to have questions from you, any kind of question. comment I want to make first. We, Eleanor and I live in Fairfield Bay. That's 80 miles north of here. We had a party not long ago, a dance, and I went to the bar to get myself a scotch and then a glass of wine, and I met uh, a man sitting there at the bar that I hadn't known before. We got into a conversation, 
and he had a thick German accent, and so do I. So uh, we got into a little conversation, and after a little while he asked me, didn't we have a wonderful time in the Hitler Youth? Well, that ended that conversation. <laughs> The question I have, what were your memories of your most painful, emotional, and physical experiences? Well, emotional experience, it was my parents getting sicker and sicker and uh, fearing for, for their lives and uh, the, the fact that my father died. We were so close to freedom. He had done everything possible to save his family. And then uh, we were on the train, and uh, I helped him walk to the restroom, and, and I was kind of joyful because here we had been released from this horrible camp, and, um, and we would be free pretty soon, and he said, I said, you know, we're very close to Switzerland, and then we'll be free, and he said, I won't make it. I think that that's the worst memory I have. Hi, um, over here. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. This has been really touching. Um, and my question for you is, um, you said you had to go off and your father's body was just left on a bench and you all continued on. Um, how did you find out where he was buried? Yeah, that's a very important question. Well, um, the town where he was taken off the train was not very far from Switzerland, and my mother and my brother were in a town close to the border in Switzerland for almost one year, and there was a Jewish community there, which included some former residents of Laupheim, the German town. They had managed to get to Switzerland, and that's how they survived the war. And they were very concerned about all the victims of the Holocaust, and funded gravestones for three, three men who had who from Bergen-Belsen who had died uh, either before arrival there or, or some other point on the train. And so that's how my mother found out because Jewish community in that town, they opened up their arms to her and they came to the hospital and visited her and then they found out the connection between where my father was buried and the, the people who lived in St. Gallen, that's the name of the town. And um, uh, my mother never visited the grave, but um, I've been there about six times now, and it's, um, uh, it's amazing how that cemetery is cared for by the community. They really have embraced it, and um, I've made friends there. Uh, I was invited to this uh, to Germany um, three years ago to participate in a symposium in Heidelberg, and uh, Heidelberg is not so far from this town, so I decided I wouldn't miss an opportunity to visit the cemetery again, and um, I was invited to speak to the high schools there. And um, so, of course, I was delighted to do that. And, and then just before my talk, I was asked if I could give my talk in German. And I said, no, absolutely not. It's a, it's a language that I, I have become estranged from. I don't like it. I have never liked it since the Holocaust. And um, I don't speak it. And then when it came to the, to the point of... Um, giving my talk to the high school students, I gave the whole talk in German. It was like unintentionally, un unconsciously, I suddenly, the language came back, and I, I spoke in German, and, um, 
it, it was a really amazing experience, and it made me feel like I had come full circle, and I didn't have hatred anymore for the Germans, and I could accept the language again and use it. Over here, no. Um, when the persecution began and you were such a young child, you had to ask yourself why uh, at such an early age. Do you remember what you were told? That's a very good question. I think my parents explained to me about the Nazis, about Hitler. You know, it wasn't difficult even as a child to compre comprehend who Hitler was because he gave all these speeches, you know, to masses of people, and, and there was Heil Hitler, and, and of course the Hitler youth, you know, and their uniforms, and they were everywhere. And so, you know, it wasn't incomprehensible that, that this were, these were people who wanted to kill the Jews, and that um, we were powerless. Dr. Better, I would just like to, before I ask my question, say uh, thank you for coming to speak to us, especially the young generation, those of us that are here tonight. God bless you for doing what you do. But my question for you is, uh, is your brother still alive, and when did your mother pass away? Uh, my brother died um, four years ago. Uh, he was two years older, so it sometimes baffles me that I am older than he was when he died. And uh, my mother, she w uh, was 86 years old, and the last 10 years she lived in Ann Arbor, where I live, and uh, she passed away then, so she, she reached a, a good age but she never really got over the Holocaust. Dr. Better, over here. The pro-life community has drawn a comparison between the Holocaust and abortion. I was wondering, as a Holocaust survivor, what are your sentiments on that comparison? Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> I, I wouldn't go along with the comparison because um, abortions um, take place before birth. And uh, the Holocaust, I mean, genocide is of, of living, growing, people who have had a life most of the time, for some time. And uh, well, I think abortion is a very complicated issue, and some people um, would choose not to, and other people have the necessity to choose abortion for whatever the reason, whether it's ill health or uh, not being able to take care of, of their infant. Uh, and um, I think it's complicated. I think we can't make decisions for individuals about such a serious decision that has to be made at times. But I think that um, killing a whole people, attempting to kill a whole people, uh, is not comparable to abortion. That's just my point of view. Um, Dr. Bader, um, thank you, first of all, for, for your talk this evening. It was very inspiring. Um, you wrote that, um, you know, that our enemies are the stories that we haven't heard, and they're the faces that we haven't seen. So besides remembering our past and how to move forward, what would be your suggestion about, or what would be your recommendations about not building walls to keep our enemies out, but opening our doors to bring our friendships in? I think we should build bridges instead of walls and cross the divide and cross the differences that exist. And um, I don't feel that walls are necessary 
or that they're even productive. I think they require vast amount of resources and those resources could be used for the benefit of people, but not to divide people instead. Hi, Ms. Butter. Thank you for sharing tonight. As a Jewish teen going through high school, being told by other youth that the Holocaust didn't happen, how would you recommend responding to that? Well, thank you for your question. I, I also experience sometimes people who say that, but to tell you the truth, it doesn't upset me greatly because there's so much evidence uh, of, of documentation and testimony and, and witnessing of individuals that I, I don't think deniers really have a chance. Besides, they usually lie, they say things that are totally wrong, totally untrue. Uh, but of course, it's um, despicable that people do, and there may always be some people who believe them and uh, carry on that point of view that it never did really happen. But I can't worry about it. There's so many other things to worry about, and there's so much documentation. You know, the Spielberg project has interviewed thousands of Holocaust survivors, and they have videotapes, and they're buried in, in seven places all over the world. So, um, and of course, that's not the only uh, documentation that exists. There are multiple people and projects of, of getting testimony from Holocaust survivors. So, um, I can't get too upset about them. Of course, if I meet them personally, I, I tell them to shut up. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Butter. And uh, let's give her another round of applause for sharing her remarkable story. I'd also like to share with you that Dr. Butter inspired over 400 middle and high school students from around the state this morning in a special student program uh, with students from Little Rock, from Little Rock Central High School, Nancy Rousseau, the principal is here, and uh, I can't tell you how much uh, I was personally inspired and uh, spoke to several students afterward that were just so grateful uh, to be able to, to hear you share your very, very timely and important story. Um, as I mentioned earlier uh, this evening, that the Clinton Foundation has an ongoing campaign to support the Anne Frank tree installation and the accompanying very important programs like this one. The fund was established to provide educational programming for students, for educators, and for the public. And these programs help us uh, promote the values of respect, the importance of dialogue, and the real need, especially now in our country, for civic engagement. You can help us continue this type of remarkable programming by purchasing an Anne Frank tree paver. Um, we have an installation around the tree where we engrave pavers uh, with people's names. And you can find more information about this important program on our website, which is clintonpresidentialcenter.org, or for my colleagues, Lena Moore, who's standing here in the back of the room, uh, my colleague, Emily Deer, and of course, our chairpersons, uh, the Ronnells here. So I hope you'll uh, think about that. It's it's a very important fund to help us continue to care for the exhibit itself, but also to continue uh, to share this kind of remarkable and inspirational programming. So thank you again for joining us this evening. If you'll please allow uh, Dr. Butter to ex exit the stage before you get up. She's going to set up outside the Great Hall here for her book signing, and uh, we look forward to welcoming you back again. Thank you. <laughs> 